So I will not talk about engineering simulation. I just want to talk about a field where engineering simulation is of critical importance. And this is clearly the connection between renewable energy sources and the energy network in Europe. So the first, first slide shows to you the different challenges we have for the 21st century. We have an alarming increase of the world energy consumption due to the growth of the population. We need to have safe electrical energy supply with or without nuclear power, depending on the different countries in Europe. We have the global impact of the greenhouse gases emissions on the climate change, and you know that we will have the COP21 meeting in Paris in the coming months. We have local air contamination by toxic emissions throughout Europe. We have limited resources and extreme dependence on fossil fuels, and I will come to that in a few minutes. We have also increase of competing utilization for, of agricultural arrays, if you think about biofuels development, for example. Of course, Europe is a very strange animal with one body and 28 heads. So that means that we have geopolitical dependencies according to different countries in Europe. We need also to maintain the competitiveness of the industries and we want to create jobs with innovative products. So that means that we need to drive for new energy supply concepts. I would like then to go back to the fundamentals, and I will be quite provocative. There are only three different types of energy sources, nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, and gravity. These are the only three sources of primary energy. All the other types of energy depend on one of these three initial ones. They change and they are different according to the type of stock, if they are sustainable or not, and how they transform the primary source into the final source of energy. And as an engineer, we know that if we have different consecutive steps, even with a very high yield, like 80%, if you have two consecutive steps of 80% yield, the final yield of your system is only 64%. So you have to limit as much as possible the transition from the primary source of energy and the final source of energy. So besides nuclear fusion, nuclear fission and gravitation, all kinds of energy are listed here. And you cannot find here hydrogen. Why? Because hydrogen is not an energy vector. It's not a source of energy, it's just a vector of energy. Hydrogen is the main constituent of the universe, that's quite clear, but on the surface of Earth there is no hydrogen. Hydrogen is always combined with different molecules. So how to produce hydrogen? You have to produce it from the main sources, and the sources are water, methane, natural gas, CH4, and clatrate, what we call the burning ice that we can find at the bottom of the oceans. You can produce hydrogen just by thermal decomposition of water, electrochemical decomposition of water, what we call the electrolysis, thermal reaction with water, and thermal reaction with methane. These are the only way to produce the hydrogen. When you try to combine all these ways to produce the hydrogen, you will see that there are different flow charts. What I would say, dark, way to produce the hydrogen is to produce hydrogen from coal, petroleum, or natural gas. Gray ones is to produce hydrogen from biomass and waste materials. And green way to produce hydrogen are to produce hydrogen directly from solar energy, geothermal energy, hydropower, wave power, tidal power, and wind power. A critical point that you can see in all this process is, of course, the water electrolysis system or the reforming step. Do we produce hydrogen in Europe? The answer is yes. You see here all the sites that are producing hydrogen located in the 28 member states. So we produce a lot of hydrogen, but mainly 
but by a process that is called steam metal reforming, so from natural gas. In fact, in the world hydrogen production, 48% of the hydrogen is produced from SMR. 30% is produced from petroleum refining, and only 4% is produced from electro electrolysis, as green hydrogen production. That means that when we are producing hydrogen, we are also producing a lot of greenhouse gases. The world hydrogen production generates about 500 million tons of CO2 per year. So it's not a green system if it's not green hydrogen production. That's why the European Commission has developed uh, what is called a European Climate and Energy Policy Framework in order to keep this sustainable development, the security of supply and the competitiveness of the uh, energy and our, our, the competitiveness of our industry. What we want to achieve is to reach different goals. You have heard about the 2020-20 goals by 2020, a lot of 20s. This has been transformed in 2014 into targets by 2030. We need to have 27% of renewable energy in our portfolio, 27% improvement in the energy efficiency, and 40% reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions. When you put that in comparison with what we are doing in terms of energy in Europe, you have to know that the European Union is importing 53% of all energy it consumes. Its imports dependency is particularly high in terms of crude oil, more than 90%, and natural gas, 66%. And this is costing to you, all European citizens, more than 1 billion euro per day in order to pay the energy bill. So what the European Union wants to do is to increase the share of the renewable energy sources in the energy mix. These renewable energy sources produce electricity, but this electricity is extremely difficult to store. That means that the electricity production from renewable energy sources is highly variable. It's changed with time. And all sectors of human activities will be affected by the need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So hydrogen as a clean energy vector can be used in all the sectors, but to contribute to the reduction of the greenhouse gas emission, it has to be green hydrogen. So that means transformation of the primary sources directly into hydrogen without growing through coal or methane. If you look, for example, at this diagram here, and that's where simulation can take place, you have here the price of electricity that is known one day in advance. You have here the production of a windmill. And you see that sometimes, if you want to keep the price of the energy, the energy and the electricity at a given level, you need to store the excess electricity. And electrolysis is one way to do it. Then you generate the hydrogen, and you can retransform the hydrogen into electricity via a fuel cell. So the idea to do that is to combine wind energy or solar energy, as you like, and if you produce electricity at the right price, use it immediately. Send it to the network and use it in the houses, in the buildings, in transport, wherever you want. If you have excess energy, then use an electrolyzer, produce hydrogen, and then store the hydrogen. When you are storing the hydrogen, you can then reuse it directly into a gas turbine if you want, or into a fuel cell with a higher efficiency. And then transform this hydrogen back into electricity for the different fields of applications. As you can see, hydrogen is the best way to store electricity, at least for a very long period of time. We can manage the different seasons in order to store the energy as hydrogen. And we have a lot of sites in Europe where we can 
send the hydrogen underground and store it. So what we have developed in the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking, that is a public-private partnership between the industry, the commission, and the research field, is to develop some devices that can use the hydrogen directly, not only for transport, like buses, vehicles, forklifts, maritime application, but also airplane application. And maybe you don't know, but there are more and more uses of hydrogen in airplanes, even in flights, but also for stationary applications, like backup power for remote area outside the grids, large-scale stationary application, and micro CHP to replace the boiler in your house but also for some portable application like providing electricity to recharge your portable telephone or your portable computer. And that's where engineering simulation is very important because all this product works, but we don't know exactly why. That means that we need to simulate what is hap happening in this kind of devices and then try to improve them progressively. The problem is that for all these kind of devices, fuel cell or modern electrolyzers, we are dealing with a very, very complex structure. And I come back to the previous speaker. A fuel cell is a device where you have multi-scale simulation needed from nanoscales to macroscale of a 3D unhomogeneous system combining ceramics, polymers, and metals containing chemical reaction and electrochemical reaction, containing three phases, solid, liquid, gas, and combining all these three dynamics with electricity. That means with current flow, voltage drop, and heat generation. So you are also generating this kind of heat and you have to eliminate this heat. So this is, on my point of view as an engineer, the most complex system. So we need you in order to improve this kind of devices. And in all projects, we have a large part of simulation involved in our projects. So what we need is clearly to develop <coughs> large-scale electrolyzers in order to catch all the requirements of uh, the policy for the energy, going to gigawatt-scale electrolyzers that doesn't exist for the moment. We are limited to maximum one megawatt electrolyzer system. <clears throat> we are developing different kind of projects, like directly combining a windmill to a refueling station for feeding the cars. Or, for example, here, it's a grocery store. It's a family-owned system where the owner decided to move from the grid to windmills. He has gone the windmills. He has different system, PEM electrolyzer, fuel cells, and he has a lot of forklifts. Forklifts powered by hydrogen. Why? Because a fuel cell forklift is very useful in order to enter the fridge. It works at very low temperature. Minus 20 is not a problem for a fuel cell. So this is quite interesting. And you will hear about the chicken and egg problem of hydrogen. You do not see cars running because there is no hydrogen infrastructure. There is no hydrogen infrastructure because there is no car to use the hydrogen. But that's not true. If you look, for example, at the chloralkali industry located in Europe, all these plants are already producing enough hydrogen to refuel today 243,000 cars or 50,000 buses. So this chicken and egg problem doesn't really exist. And if you combine all of this, you will be able to connect the different grids that exist in Europe. This is also part of the simulation. And that's what we would like to do, is that the hydrogen is used as an energy vector in order to combine and to connect the electricity grid, the natural gas grid, and the trans-European transport network. This is the perfect way to connect these networks that are presently completely separated. Mm -hmm.